Thank you for joining us at First Assembly of God Church in Clear Lake, California. Please welcome Rev. Lisa Kugler. So we're going to open in prayer. So, Father God, I just thank you, Lord, for this time in you that everyone came out and had good fellowship and time together and um, got filled up by your your praise and worship to you and honoring you and feeling your love. You just poured out your love and your Holy Spirit back on us, God. And I just pray that you would reveal your word to us tonight. And if anything came in with us that's not supposed to be messing around in our heads so that we can't focus, I just pray that it would be silenced in Jesus' name so that we can hear the truth and live in the freedom that you've called us to live in. Being a Christian is not about just being saved and forgiven. It's about living a powerful life and a powerful witness, a life abundantly to the full till we overflow. And a lot of the times we get caught up in the middle of that and forget that it's not just about being forgiven. It's about living out that forgiveness and thankfulness and um, observing all the freedoms that we have in Christ. But we do have an enemy, and he does try to prevent us from the growth And he does try to prevent us from understanding who we are in Christ and what's available to us, and it's called warfare. And warfare is not just about rebuking the devil. It's not about just having things happen to you and you don't know why, because that does happen, and God will give you the ability to discern that, what it is. But also, a lot of the times, real spiritual warfare has to do with how obedient we are or how much... God's word we're learning and applying in our life. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. The message is called Choose Life. And it's an extension of what I taught last month. Because when I went away last month, um, I don't see the person that I got to pray with. But he, he came to me and he said, I know all of these things that you're saying, but I'm not free. And I couldn't rest in that. It bothered me so bad when I went away because that's happened to me. It's taken me years in some areas of my life to really receive the written word of God in that area and cut that stuff away. So we're going to address this at a deeper level. So we're going to let God have his way. The first scripture I have is Colossians 2.15. Okay? And it says, When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, they're stomping on the devil's head down there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're preparing. (laughs) Um, So uh, when he had disarmed, this is Jesus, the rulers and the authorities, those spiritual forces of evil operating against us, we do have an enemy. Yes, I'm going to do some devil talk tonight. We have to understand what we face and why we face it. He made a public example of them, exhibiting them as captives in his triumphal procession having triumphed over them through the cross. Jesus delivered us from everything that the enemy tried to use to bind us. And he, in the heavenlies, took a train with all those enemies bound up in that train and rolled them through the heavenlies, and they were the captives, not us. So if we're that free, why do we still experience warfare? Because the only thing that we what we have to be open to the enemy's attacks is what we let him have in us the areas of our life that are not surrendered to the sanctifying work of the holy spirit when you become a christian you become justified you become right with god through the blood of jesus you're forgiven but there's a process called sanctification it means you set yourself apart to be made holy that just means You start becoming like Jesus. You are made in the image, and now you're going to realize who you are, what's available to you. You're going to live for the Lord. You're going to do great things. You're going to learn great things. You're going to help other people get free. And Satan doesn't want you to know any of that. So he's going to pull out all the stops. It's like a small child that doesn't know their boundary. And they keep pressing you and pressing you to see if you'll set a boundary with them. And one or two times, they won't listen to you. They keep going after you. And finally, when you say, no, that's it, They sit down and do what they're supposed to do because you set the boundary. You were done with it. And that's the same thing that we have to do with the word of God in our life when the enemy is coming at us in the area and we have to say, okay, no. And sometimes we'll run around a mountain 
400 times before we learn to set the boundary, right? So, the person that I prayed for said, I know what Jesus did for me on the cross, but I'm not free. I've been cursed. Well, Jesus became a curse for us on the cross and took every curse on himself. So we are free of any curses. But in his mind, he could not process that he was free. He's like, I've caused all this damage to all these people in my life because of a generational curse that I believe. And I said, I gave him all these scenarios. I told him all these scriptures. And he's just looking at me like he's clueless. And I'm like, I've been there. And I know what this is. You need to get with some men. You need to. And I'm not saying this to hurt anybody or to uncover anybody. I'm saying this because every one of us are no different. And every one of us have these same things happening to us. We just don't always speak about it or feel brave enough to confront it and tell someone. And I was glad that they did because I know what that's like. I've hid in my own stuff for years because I didn't want anyone to think I was weak. We have to lay down the pride and get real because our life is really affected by what we think. So what happens for this person next is he's got to get the word of God in him, in that area. He's got to find out that he is free. He's got to study about that curse that he's been delivered for and that it, when you, once you make a decision in Christ, you have all those freedoms given to you because Jesus untied and unloosed all the binds of the devil on your life when he went to the cross. There's nothing there. In the light of eternity, it's been finished. But we have a partnership with God where we have to go forward and work in the sanctifying process to become like him. And that's putting off the old man. Shedding off in recovery, they call it living clean and sober. You don't play with those same playmates anymore. You learn the readings. You apply the principles. You have a spiritual awakening in that area. It's the same thing with the Bible. You study the Bible in that area. You live a new way. You experience a spiritual awakening in there. It's called exchanging a truth for a lie. Okay? Sometimes people will point out a freedom, and we just can't get it. You know that that's one to go right down and study. <laughs> okay? The process of renewal happens when you exchange the lie for the truth and it doesn't happen all at once it takes time when you recognize a lie to your mind something that keeps bothering you something that you keep struggling in something that you keep falling over then you go to God's word or another Christian and, and, and get prayer and get the wisdom that you need the scriptures that you need and you start studying and you carry it on a piece of paper when I first became a Christian I was so jacked up my mind was a mess <laughs> I was just coming off drugs and alcohol, struggling with sexual addictions. I had it all. So can you imagine what kind of warfare was coming against me because I was trying to get free and live with the realities of who I am now, my new condition in Christ? It's hard for you to believe the word of God when you've done all this stuff in your life. It takes time to break down those strongholds, but every stronghold has been taken down at the cross. You just have to accept that truth and keep staying on it and not giving up. Just because we are saved does not mean we're not going to face problems from our past. Just because you are saved doesn't mean you're going to have a perfect Christian walk. Just because you're saved doesn't mean that you're going to do everything right and always trust God and always depend on God. It's a process. But the more you know, the easier it gets. And the more authority that you know that you have in the Lord, the easier it gets. In your past, everybody has experienced some sort of slavery, whether it's a bad marriage, abuse. You know, maybe you've been um, struggling with sexual perversions, um, wrong thought patterns that just controlled your mind, ridiculous addictions, fears and phobias memories from your past of things that have happened to you. There's a vast amount of things that we carry into our Christian walk that have to come to the surface, have to be healed to keep walking in victory. And it's in those places where the enemy is going to find an open door and attack. And we don't have to be afraid. We just have to be aware. We just have to be alert. And the people of God perish because they have a lack of knowledge. You have to learn your word. 
I used to put scriptures all over these pieces of paper and carry them with me at work. I'd be in surgery room with this patient on the table, and I'm having panic and anxiety attacks and freaking out because it's dark in there, and I've got all this stuff going to my mind. I'm trying to focus on what I'm doing, and I can't leave. I can't run. And what does panic make you want to do? Flee. I had to get those scriptures in my mind because every time I would go in one of those operating rooms, that would happen to me. It was very hard for me. But we all have our stories. But it was the best thing that happened to me because it taught me how to apply the word of God. Hi, Leslie. You can come in now. <laughs> she peeked. Um, so we've talked in the past about the Israelites and how they were in bondage for 400 years, right? And they cried out to God and God delivered them, right? Once they got free, God told them, you got this promised land ahead of you. And you're going to take this 11-day journey. And it actually took them 40 years because they had what you call wilderness mentalities. They didn't know how to live free because it was unknown to them. They'd never experienced freedom. They were used to their taskmaster, being in bondage, working like a slave day and night. And Egypt is a type of world. And don't us Christians, when we come out, have a type of world that we have to learn how to live in now and we can't live the old way. we got to come into the unknown in Christ and learn what our freedoms are, right? Um, we all have residual of the past. But if it's not removed, this is where the enemy tries to come in and get a foothold, right? He exerts power in an area of weakness where you still struggle and it's unconfessed and you haven't gotten help in that, he comes and energizes that area and stirs it up. And you think, God, I've, oh, I thought I overcome some of this. I thought because I'm saved now that I'm going to get better at dealing with this. Well, it's a good thing it's coming to the service because, surface because now you can deal with it. But then the enemy will want you to feel condemned about it and you can't tell anybody that. Okay? So God promised the Israelites this land filled with milk and honey but they had to go into the land and take back that land but in the land it was filled with inhabitants already and the lord told them that they were going to have to go in and dispossess the current occupants which means kick them out but when they saw them they were looking at giants and they're like how can we simply overcome well the lord told them that they could but they didn't believe because they didn't know how to operate in faith they didn't know how to fight the good fight of faith. They didn't have any tools yet. They didn't have the ability to really listen to their leadership at the time and really know how to, you know, have faith and see through the eyes of faith. They saw through the eyes of fear and everything that they'd already experienced in the past, okay? So hold on to that. Um, for us, it's time for us to start taking the promises in God's word and learning them who we are, what's available to us, and apply those things to our life, all right? If we don't, we're going to continue to have warfare, and our growth will continue to be prevented and stunted, and we don't want that because all of our hearts to even come here tonight is because we want to grow, because we want to hear something that's going to change our life. We need that one thing for tonight because of everything that's going on that we can hold on to because when we go out those doors, it's who's there for us? Well, that Jesus is. And you got the word, okay? The Bible says we're to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. This is a sanctifying process. It's not that we have to be afraid of God. It's that we come to know him through the process of sanctification. And we come to love him because of what he's done for us. And then it makes it easier for us to do the things he's asking to do. It motivates us into the right way because of the love for us. Because he wants us to be free. He wants us to overcome. He wants to give us all the tools that we need to live this life. He doesn't want us to stay in bondage or in fear in any area. So, Satan tries to rob us in areas of wrong thinking, wrong believing, past memories, okay, and fears, all kinds of odd fears. Years of wrong teachings, and things that have been passed down to you generationally that really aren't your fault, okay? So 
The enemy knows the importance of our mind, but do you? Do you know the importance of taking control of your mind? Before we're saved, we can't take control of our mind because our soul is out of control and it's in charge. It's going to do and think. I, had, I remember this. I'll never forget it one time. Before I became a Christian, I was driving to go to one destination, and then I ended up in Lakeport, and I'm like, what am I doing? All of a sudden, I just had this idea that I had to go there. There was no rhyme or reason to what I was doing, and it bothered me for months and years. And then when I became a Christian, I realized God was already trying to teach me back then about the power of the mind and the power of what you think. You have no control over your mind before you become a Christian. But when you ask Jesus in your heart, he, his spirit is renewed in you, and you now have the ability to control the mind, the will, and the emotions, and your body. Okay? I'm going to give you a few scriptures. They're not on the board, but these are things that I wrote down, that it's the importance of knowing why it's, you've got to control your mind. Because if you don't control your mind, Satan will control and manipulate everything you do in your life. Romans 12, 2, must be renewed in the, in the mind, Okay? you got to learn what's yours, what, what's not working for you, and that you don't have to have the insanity in, anymore, and you can find out what's going to work for you. You have this one here. It says, be renewed in the spirit of the mind, Ephesians 4.23. Put on the new man, Ephesians 4.24. Stop acting like you did in the world and start acting the way God says you can. That's huge. That's huge for me because I still act like the person in the world. I come in here and preach these messages, and then I go home and fall on my face, and then God says, there shouldn't be that many teachers and preachers because you have to live according to the knowledge that you have, and if you don't live to the standard that is set for you, you're not a very good witness. So I have to come up higher before I can even say some of this stuff, and sometimes I'm not there. I haven't arrived yet, and I drag my feet. I have willful disobedience, but I don't try to let it stay there. I try to become willing to let him deal with stuff. There's another one. It says, let the word of God dwell in you richly. Colossians 3.16. When you let the word of God permeate your mind and permeate your spirit, and it's coming out of your mouth, coming in your mind, out of your mouth, that is going to direct you. That is going to guide you. That is going to give you the freedom. But when you let all that other stuff in there stay, that is going to lead you back to where you don't want to go. Um, this is a really good one. Dan taught me this, but I didn't even remember it until today. Gird up the loins of the mind. These men in the Bible used to wear these long dresses that would drag, and they had to gird them up so they could walk. And when you are tripping on God's promises, it's because you haven't girded up your mind. You should be walking out God's promises, not falling over them. That was so powerful to me today. Renewing the mind is a journey, and it happens little by little. It will, it'll take you a lifetime, but it is important to be alert. It is important to be aware. It is important to be dedicated. It's important to have tenacity to go after renewing the mind. And if you don't and you just think, oh, well, it's okay, well, then the results that you're already experiencing where you don't have any freedom are going to continue. And we can't blame God for that. We have to take a responsibility. And God's like, I have given you my ability if you respond to my word, I will give you the ability to do what you need to do. We're not on our own, but a lot of the times we think we are. No matter how bad your life may seem, and no matter how bad your mind may be, because mine was pretty messed up, and it still is at times when I let it, when I let it, when I let it get out of control. I spent the first five years as a Christian trying to figure out when Joyce Myers said very loud and clear, you can control your thoughts. I'm like, that is a lie because mine is a mess and I don't know how to even get it to stop talking to me all the time. <laughs> That's the renewing of the mind. It's the more word you put in there, that stuff flushes out and cuts away and gets out. And then God, you start to realize God. The revelations start happening. The illuminations start happening. And when the illuminations start happening, He's going to come after you. But you've got to say, I already know what your trick is. You're not. I'm still going after God. I'm going to go harder. That's where the tenacity comes in. That's where the spirit of resilience comes in. God gives us a resilient spirit that no matter what happens, no matter what we go through, he won't let us quit and give up as long as we keep asking him to help us not quit and give up. It takes time to renew the mind. And um, there's two things. 
that God wants to say to us tonight. Two things, very simple, very, very simple things. One, some of us may not be confronting certain areas of our life, okay? God is trying to work with us, and we do it for a little bit, and then we, we're like, no, we're not going there. We're just going to leave that over there. Two, some of us are trying really hard to renew the mind, and we feel like a failure because it's nothing. We do all these right things, but we don't see any change, and everything seems worse, right? People say in recovery, stick around and wait for the miracle. Well, you have to do that here too. You have to stick around and wait for the breakthrough because we're not supposed to be weary. Galatian, or no, it's uh, Galatians 6, 9 says, don't be weary. Let us not grow weary or become discouraged in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap if we do not give in. All he asks is that we don't give up. Isaiah 43, 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. When you decide to get after it, that thing that's going on, you're going to have the fire and you're going to get weary. But all he asks is that you don't give up, that you keep going. You might fall seven times because the Bible says the righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up. That's because he knows who he is in Christ. And no matter how many times he fails, he's going to get back up and try again. If you knew how many times I overate in the last five years when I told God I wasn't going to do it tomorrow, you would be like, what is her problem? But I get back up and I keep going. I got four days this week. Christina reminded me. <laughs> it takes time, okay? That's Proverbs 24, 16. The righteous man may fall seven times, but gets back up. This is the main scripture that God gave me when I was going through a battle. I was trying to do ministry, raise a family, go to college full time, and my mind was under attack so bad. And when I say under attack, I mean lying spirit coming with every kind of lie you can possibly imagine. And it was just in their speaking. It wasn't that I had a mental issue, but it could have become a mental issue if I would have believed all the lies that was coming into my head. And what I had to do was go to this scripture. This is what God gave me. I woke up at like 3.45 in the morning. I'm like, you've got to give me something. And he said, you don't need medication. You need to learn the word of God. Because I was different than other people. Some people do need medication to get their mind slowed down long enough for them to be able to heal. My situation was different. It was a great spiritual attack because I was going to teach the word of God. And my, I had received a call of God on my life not too long after that to preach. So what was happening was all these breakthroughs were getting ready to happen. And all these things, I started to teach Dan's Bible study. And then these great attacks started happening. This growth was happening in my life and these attacks started happening. And so what the devil wanted me to do was give in, throw in the towel. But sometimes it would die down when I wasn't working on my stuff. And I was like, oh, okay, if I just don't do anything, the attacks will go away. Just give me a break. Habakkuk 3.19. This is key for everybody who has a crazy life, tons of trouble going on, tons of responsibility, and you've got to make progress in it. You have no choice but to make progress because you can't bow down. You want to. You want to give up, but you can't because God won't let you. So the scripture says this, that we develop hind's feet. A hind is an animal that can climb swiftly, okay? Not to stand still in terror, but to walk. And make spiritual progress upon my high places of trouble, suffering, or responsibility. Okay? God strengthens us to go through all these things. And he gives us the encouragement that we need, the word of God that we need for just the right situation. He's never late. He will always come through for you. It may not come in the form that you want it. But when you're, you have a listening ear and you ask for wisdom and you say, God, I need you to speak to me, he is never going to fail you because your help comes from the Lord who is the maker of heaven and earth, right? And you may feel like you want to give up on that mountain that you're facing, but he's going to teach you to climb it. 
It takes faith to go through. We don't give up. We all have a measure of faith, and we all have a gift of faith for certain things that we need to believe God for at the time. And I believe at that season in my life that God gave me an extra measure of faith to go through all the trials that I was experiencing. And it's going to be different for everybody in here. And I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm trying to show you that there's victory and that there's truth to get you up and running again, back where you're, your race where you're supposed to be. Instead of going around the mountain, you're going to go up over the mountain. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth, and Jesus is the life. He is the word of life. I want you to think about that for a second. He is the word of life. He is the word of life. I said before, if we're not living a Christian walk where we're experiencing some victory and some joy and some happiness, we're doing something wrong. I've been doing something wrong for a really long time because I'm not studying to the, to the word of God. I'm not standing on the word of God. I'm not speaking those promises out. I'm not waiting on God. I'm getting weary. I'm giving up on God. You got to wait and you got to let him encourage you and strengthen you and to re-energize you to keep going. Okay? So in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory and the glory of the Father. He's full of grace, and he's full of truth, okay? Deuteronomy 30, 19 says this. The word of God says, I have called heaven and earth, to witness this day against you that I have set before you life and death, the blessings and the curses. Therefore, choose life that you and your descendants may live. Jesus is saying, choose me. I am the word of life. He gives us, the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus comes to give us life abundantly to the full Tell it overflows. You can't even measure what he wants to pour out on you if you get into the process of renewing your mind and cooperating with the Holy Spirit sanctifying process. He wants to deliver you, wants to set you free, wants to move powerfully in you so you could have victory. He doesn't share his glory. He won't let you do it on your own. A lot of the times we think we can keep doing what we're doing and it's going to work for us. That's insanity. He's like, no, just surrender. I will make you willing to become willing in an area that you, if you let me just have my way in you, I will show you that agreeing with me is not hard and agreeing with him is the obedience part. It's getting at that thing that's ruining your life, that thing that you want to really get rid of, but you keep falling back into old ways. That's what this is talking about. Some of us have dwelt on this mountain long enough, right? And he's saying, Choose life. You have thousands and thousands of thoughts presented to yourself every day, some from the enemy, some from your own flesh, and some from God, right? So you have to decide what's what, but you can't really decide unless you know the word of God. So you've got to be able to say, okay, what's happening? What, why am I thinking this way? In recovery, they take an inventory, right? It's a moral inventory of the areas of struggle in your life. I remember one time I did an inventory with Teresa. It was a really big one. But I'm like, oh, all I would have to do, and this was like eight years ago, and I said, oh, all I would have to do is take all these things and study God's word and live it out. And I never did that. I still struggle with some of those things on that list. Shame on me, right? No, no there's no condemnation. But God is that gracious that he lets us see it and says, okay, what do you want to do about this, Right? Proverbs, this is the other part of it. So you have the thoughts. If, you, if you're thinking negative, fleshly thoughts, you're going to speak negative. If you're thinking positive, encouraging thoughts, you're going to speak positive. Proverbs 18.21 says that death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they who indulge in it will eat of it. And Pastor Chris did a really good series like seven or eight months ago on that, and I think it's still online, so that would be a really good thing to listen to. But the, the reason why I say that is because when you start working in an area and you start making progress, things will heat up. And you're going to be like, okay, 
you're going to fall down. You're going to have a setback. You're not going to accomplish it today because it's little by little. Sometimes God will let us go through a process because there, if, we did, if we got deliverance right away, we wouldn't appreciate it, number one, and then we'd have pride because we think that we had something to do with it and we don't need God. And that's not how it works. And it's called the, pri- the beast of the field. And he says that he will take down those beasts of the field because he wants the glory. I can't remember where that scripture is at. Um, and also, we're going to go through a, a time of suffering. From the time you know you have a problem until the time you get delivered from that problem, you're going to experience a suffering in your flesh or because of some of the circumstances that the issue has created. And it's hard. It's hard to face that. But it also... When you get on board with God, he takes that suffering and makes it a glorious moment. And, and you don't even know the things that God has for you when you overcome that thing. And you get to the other side of it and you see what he did for you and how he never left you. And those times begin to build up and build up and build up over time. And pretty soon you have faith and trust in God that you didn't even know that you could possibly have. And that you can't take that away from someone. That is a real tangible relationship. That is real. Okay, King David said that he had to speak to himself when he got into certain situations because he would start speaking. He wanted to speak life over the situation. He didn't discount his feelings, but he said, why are you cast down in herself? Hope in God and wait expectantly for him, for I shall yet praise him, my help and my God. Because when you fall on your face or you have a setback, it's so easy to start speaking curses out of your mouth. And when you start speaking things out of your mouth that don't belong there, you hear yourself say it. You begin to agree with yourself more. You, you believe yourself more than you believe anybody else. When you, it's in the same thing goes for when you're speaking the truth. Okay, yes, I failed, Lord. Thank you that I can wait on you. Thank you that you forgive me. Thank you that we're going to keep doing this. Thank you that the energy is going to come to try again, that I'm righteous, that I'm forgiven by the blood of Jesus. We're going to do it again, and we're going to do it again, and we're going to do it again until we overcome it, and I'm going to trust in you to bring me through to the overcoming power of Jesus Christ because that's what he gives us. He gives us the ability to be overcomers. We're more than a conqueror because he already did the finished work. Now we just observe it. We just live it out on this earth. Okay? Don't let yourself become discouraged and don't let condemnation set in. One thing, if you let condemnation set in, you won't try. You won't try to get out of it. And the Bible says in Romans 8 1, I know I have it down somewhere. There is therefore now no condemnation, no guilty verdict, no punishment for those who are in Christ Jesus. And this is the key who believe in him as personal Lord and Savior. Not only is he the Savior, but you're counting on him as your Lord, and you're going to let him sanctify you, and you're going to work that process out. That's how we can say we don't have to feel guilty because we're working with him. Even if we fall on our face, we get back up, acknowledge what he did for us, and keep going. But when you don't know the revelation that you don't have to carry the guilt and the shame, you won't trust him. You won't think he's good. You won't experience his love, and you'll feel hopeless, and you'll give up and quit. And I think the bottom line that God wants us to know is that there's things that he has to get to the bottom of with us if we want to go to the next step in this church. Things The Spirit of God wants to pour out, but there's a hindrance. There's a, a, something preventing every one of us in some area. And I want you to think about that for a second. Is it too late to have pastor come? And Teresa, because Nick can do my song. All right, and if the altar team could come, I want, I'm still going to talk for a minute because I got a lot more to say. But I'm trying to stay on time. Um, If we sin, if we willfully struggle with an area of temptation, if we have an area that's unchanged, if we have memories that haunt us, if we have fears that hold us down, those are the things that he wants to get at. 
because those are the things that Satan is going to use to keep you from observing who Jesus Christ made you to be. It's about getting free. It's about letting him show you how to live the real Christian life. Not doing it in your own strength. Not doing it the way you think you can manage a situation. We're all really good at praying for God to deliver us in the way we think that we should be delivered. But all he asks is that we humble our hearts, that we lay down pride, that we become willing. If you're not willing to let something go, say, I don't want to let it go, but get me to the place that I can tolerate letting it go. Get me to the place where I can believe that it's affecting my life. Show me how Satan is ripping my life apart because I'm letting this thing stay. I don't want to be a willful person in disobedience and not in agreement, believing lies, believing the things that are taking me down. I've already done that once and it didn't work for me. I've already done that once and I know the outcome. That's why I came looking for a savior the first time. But now that I know you as savior, I need you as Lord of my life. Areas that I want you to be in and areas I don't want you to be in. I need freedom. I can't care what people say about me coming to the altar. I can't care that people think I look stupid on my face crying out to God. I can't care that these things are hindering me and I don't want people to know. I want to be free because that's what you died to give me. And if I stand in your way any longer, it's my fault. I can't blame you, God. The Israelites blamed God. They complained and they murmured in their hearts against God and said they'd rather go back to bondage than let him deliver them. That's what they did. That is not who we are. That is not what he's called us to do. Humble the heart and let him have his way. That's all he asks. If you haven't made him savior, make him savior tonight. If you want to know who he is, come and find out. These altar people have wisdom. They have counsel. They can take you in a room. They can show you what you need to do to get through a situation. They can pray over you. You can acknowledge it to God and put your hands up and say, take my will in my life and guide me and show me the way to live. It's that simple. We have to have an abandonment to God, a surrender to God, a freedom to give everything that we are because there's nothing left in the world for us. The Israelites never got the inheritance that was due to them. We can have everything in the Bible that Jesus says that we can have. You just have to let him help you to do that. If you're trying to rely on yourself to overcome, you're never going to do it. It's not meant to be that way. God doesn't share his glory. All he asks is that you surrender and trust his strength. Trust his word to encourage you. Trust his power that's in you, that's living in you, that's dwelling in you to rise up and help you choose life. Because he wants you. He said, I stand before heaven. Let them be a witness today. Life or death. Blessing or curses. Choose life that you may live and your descendants may live. That man that I prayed for the other day, he said, I'm affecting all the people around me, generations, because he refused to deal with the stuff and believe what God was saying at the time. But I hope that he gets it. I hope that he studies. I hope that he observes the word of God in that area and he can get himself with the Lord and let go to be free so that that thing doesn't continue working generation after generation. What we choose affects our children. What we choose affects our families. It affects people around us that don't know the Lord. It matters. Your mind matters. It matters to Satan and it should matter to you. This altar is open now. 
If you feel your heartstrings being tugged, that is not you. You don't tug your own heart. If you feel a drawing from the Holy Spirit, that is not you. You don't draw yourself. He draws you. He's jealous for you. He loves you. He doesn't want to be blamed anymore for the problems not getting solved. The altar is open and we will pray. We will meet you where you're at. We will walk you through stuff. We will all work together. We are all in the same boat.